Welcome to episode 4 of the Simple Door Pod series. In this video, I'll be showing you how we custom mold metal mesh in order to protect our speakers and tweeters and accent our beautiful custom made door pods. Let's begin. In the previous video, we finished wrapping our inside trim rings. You may recall that I mentioned making sure that you have a copy of that inside ring. This copy of the inside ring is our starting point for making our formed grill mesh. To start, I'm transferring the outer profile and then rough cutting it out with a jigsaw. I then adhere my master template to this newly cut out piece with double-sided sticky template tape. Then, using a router table, I use a quarter inch spiral trim bit in order to flush trim the outside perimeter to my master profile shape. After I've drilled a quarter inch hole, I slide the piece over the router bit and then cut out the inside perimeter of my master profile shape. This process is covered in more detail in the first video of this video series, so if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to click the on-screen annotation or use the link in the video description. I trace around what's left of the quarter inch shape onto a new piece of half inch thick material and rough cut this out as well. I then once again use double sided template tape in order to stick my two pieces together. This time though, I'm also going to apply these spacers which will allow me to use a router safety shield. With a two flute flush trim bit loaded into our router table, we can now make a copy of the new inside shape. I like to use the Mobile Solutions router safety shield as it allows me to have maximum control over the piece and keep my hand far away from the bit. At around $60, the shield is much more cost effective than a trip to the emergency room. Do keep in mind though that since Mobile Solutions is a sponsor of Car Audio Fabrication, they have a special offer for all car audio fabrication fans, so be sure to call them and ask for the special discount. The link to this shield is in the video description. I now want to shrink our new piece by 5 16ths of an inch, so I select the appropriately sized bearing and fit it to my rabbiting bit. If you're unfamiliar with the rabbiting bit, we can control how far we cut into the piece by selecting a bearing size, and we can control how tall we cut into the piece by adjusting our height on our router. Since this is a big, scary, dangerous router bit, we're only cutting about an eighth of an inch away on our first pass. For our second pass, I'll raise the bit once again and cut away another eighth of an inch for a total of a quarter of an inch. Ultimately, I repeat this process four times until the full thickness of a half inch is removed. This leaves me with just the thickness of our quarter inch piece which I'll then also flush trim away. So in review, although we could have done this with only a couple of passes, I like to do it with multiple just to be safe with removing only a small amount of material at a time. After flipping over the wood so that I can stick the quarter inch piece to a new half inch piece, I once again repeat this same process. This leaves me with a quarter inch piece of wood sandwiched between two half inch pieces of wood that are all the same profile. We now need to add a chamfer to this piece, so I'll be using a 45 degree router bit. In order to be precise, I slightly raise the router bit until the cutting edge is flush with the bottom edge of the wood. I then count the number of revolutions in order to raise the bit exactly a quarter of an inch. This time I'll be making two passes in order to complete a cut that's a half inch tall. So I make my first pass, adjust my router table, and then make my second. Because of the size of this router bit, it's once again critical that I use proper safety. With two passes complete, I now have the inside of one of my pieces that I'll be using to mold the mesh. I repeat this process by flipping over the assembly and re-sticking it to the router safety shield and then making those same two passes in order to copy this same profile onto the opposite side of the piece. I'm left with two mirror copy replicas that have this chamfer and thanks to the quarter inch piece in between, I was able to maximize the chamfer that's on each of the two pieces. With the woodwork complete, we can now move on to creating this box which will allow us to press the material. This box features a top and bottom piece that have been flush trimmed to one another. It also has four walls that guide the top into being perfectly flush with the bottom. I wrote my name on it in this corner to ensure that I always put the pieces together exactly the same. Here I line up my inside and outside pieces so that the gap between them is consistent. I'll make small marks around the inside piece so that I know when I place it in with template tape that it's in a good position. I apply several small pieces of the template tape to the back side of the inside shape in order to stick it to the bottom piece. Since I like to reuse my mold boxes, I apply very, very little tape. Otherwise, it's very difficult to remove the template shapes. With the inside shape carefully lined up and stuck to the bottom piece of the mold box, I'll then apply two small pieces to the outside shape. These small pieces will only be holding the outside shape in place for a small amount of time, so it's not important that they're very big. 
The goal here is to apply more pieces of tape to the top of the outside template. That way when you apply the top of the mold box and stick it together, it will remove with the top of the mold box. I hope that made sense. If it didn't, go back and watch it again. Now that the mold box is complete, I measure the size of my mold box and I'll transfer this to a piece of sheet metal and then cut it out. There's a link to this particular mesh that I'm using down in the video description. I chose it because it's what I used on the underseat subwoofer box build. If you're new to my channel and you want to learn more custom fabrication, you should be sure to check out that series as well. With our mesh properly sized, we can now load it into our mold box. Next I use my 12 ton hydraulic press in order to actually press the grill mesh. If you don't own a press, I'd encourage you to check around with some of your buddies that might be auto mechanics as they probably do. If all else fails, sneak into a hardware store and use theirs. Just kidding, don't do that. But also, do note, with such a large piece, you're likely going to have to move around multiple different times and press in different areas. With the molding process complete, we can remove the top half of the mold box. I then lay the molded mesh onto the top of the mold box and I'll transfer the lines that I need to cut. There are multiple different tools you can use to cut mesh, but for this mesh I found snips to be the best. After removing my inside shape and laying down the copy side, I then repeat this process again for the mirror. And with that, we can now insert our newly molded grill mesh and follow it up with the inside trim ring and marvel at our molded mesh creation. So I want to let you guys know a few additional tips that you can use when you're forming metal mesh. First of all, you can paint your metal mesh in order to accent it with a different color. You could paint it with like a metallic red, things like that. Anything that can kind of change up the custom look is a good idea. I actually ended up adding a metallic silver and then clear coating it just to give it a little bit different look. Now another tip I wanted to note, this metal mesh has a very large open area. I believe it's actually a half inch between each of these hexagon shapes. And what you should note about that is when you have a large open area, you need to draw the metal more when you're molding it in order to be able to see the actual curvature of, uh, of the bend in the mold. So I encourage you guys to check out one of my other series I did where I molded metal mesh because it was a much finer diamond mesh and you can really, really see the curvature. So I'll be sure to put a link on the screen here so you guys can check that out as well. So something else I wanted to do in this episode is I wanted to ask you guys a car audio related question. I'd like to see who's actually watching these videos and who checks in, and I'd also just like to get your guys' opinion. So the question of this episode is, rear speakers in an install, do you keep them or do you delete them? Because the idea is a lot of people say if you get rid of them, it's better just to have the front stage speakers because you're getting the ultimate audiophile experience. In other words, if you were at a concert, all the instruments and singers are in front of you. So do you only keep the front speakers or do you also have the front and the rear speakers? Let me know what your guys' opinion is and post down in the comments below. Finally, a special thanks to Emmanuel Valletta, Truman, Christopher Martinson, Jerry Gibson, and Jason Marble. These guys are the Patreon support team, along with a bunch of other people. They help support this video content. If you can even help me out with donating a dollar a video, seriously, it really helps out towards the purchase of all these crazy materials and all the time that I put into editing. I'd really appreciate it. So anyway, next video, I'm gonna be showing you guys how we wrap the rest of this, and then we're gonna start talking about how we actually attach it to the door panel. So be sure to, if you haven't already, subscribe, stay tuned, and until next time, you guys know what to do.